intracranial course and exit from the cranial cranium. Cranial nerves supplying the extraocular muscles have a fairly long intracranial course. Whereas cranial nerves like the hypoglossal nerve has a short intracranial course. Olfactory nerve never leaves the cranial cavity. It stays on the cripiform plates in the anterior cranial fossa. The optic nerve leaves the cranial cavity through the optic canal. The oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the abducens nerve leaves the cranial cavity through superior and inferior orbital fissures. The maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve leaves through foramen rotundum and the mandibular division, the trigeminal nerve leaves through foramen ovale. Facial nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve leaves the cranial cavity by entering the internal acoustic meatus. It has a course inside the petrous temporal bone before finally exits through the stylomastoid foramen. 9, 10 and 11 cranial nerves leave through the jugular foramen and finally the hypoglossal nerve leaves through the hypoglossal canal at the foramen magnum. We will take a look at the individual nerves and their pathways. The olfactory nerve, the first cranial nerve, uh, the first order neurons of the olfactory nerve start from the olf olfactory mucosa and passes through the cribriform plate and synapse with the cell bodies of the second order neuron inside the olfactory bulb. The second order neuron nerve fibers form the olfactory nerve or the olfactory tract which divides into two and one enters the anterior perforated substance and the other fibers enter the uncus area. One thing that is important to remember about the olfactory pathway is that it, unlike all other sensory pathways, it bypasses the thalamus and enters the cortical areas directly. Optic nerve or the second cranial nerve the brain has a contralateral representation of the body. This is the general rule. When it comes to vision, the visual fields are also represented contralaterally in the brain. If you take the whole visual field, you can divide it into a right visual field and a left visual field. The right visual field the information from the right visual field reaches the left side of the brain and the information from the left visual field reaches the right side of the brain going by the general rule of contralateral <coughs> representation in order to do that uh, if you divide the, uh, the retina of the eye into two halves, nasal half and the, uh, the temporal half, uh, the information from the, for instance from the right visual field will fall on the temporal half of the left uh, eye, uh, eyeball, the retina and the nasal half of the right uh, retina of the right eyeball.
and this information from the uh, left uh, temporal half and the right nasal half will ultimately go on to the left side of the brain. So the nasal half fibers will have to cross each other to reach the opposite side of the brain. Here is the left optic nerve and here is the right optic nerve. The nasal fibers from the left and right uh, retina cross and form what is called optic chiasma in relation to the pituitary stalk here. And the, the temporal fibers and the nasal fibers from the opposite eyes unite and form what is called optic tract. <coughs> This is left optic tract and this is right optic tract. Fibers coming through the optic tract synapse at the lateral geniculate body or the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus before it finally reaches the occipital lobe or the visual cortex surrounding the calcarine sulcus. The visual path has an extension for visual reflexes which I will be discussing in detail in the next slide. Now we will go into little bit more details about the pathway of the optic nerve. Uh, this is the uh, left and right optic nerves. And optic chiasma here and uh, the left, at right, left and right optic uh, tracts. Now the, the nerve fibers coming through the optic tract on each side uh, get separated out and uh, reach three destinations. Now as I said before in the previous slide, uh, one set of fibers synapse in the lateral geniculate body and uh, they uh, end up in the, uh, the, the visual cortex go through the optic radiation and end up in the uh, visual uh, cortex here. And uh, then uh, there's another set of fibers uh, going towards the superior colliculus uh, for bodily reflexes. Now uh, one example for bodily reflexes uh, coming through the optic nerve uh, is uh, if you flash a torch suddenly on a cat the cat will jump. So this is because of this uh, fibers ending in the superior colliculus and giving rise to uh, nerve tracts, um, nerve tracts coming down into the, uh, the, the muscles of the limbs and the trunk uh, so that uh, the, the cat will reflexly jump when you flash a torch. Uh, then the third group of fibers uh, go to the pretectal nucleus uh, very closely related to the, uh, the optic nucleus and the edinger westphal nucleus uh, at the superior colliculus area and, and these fibers are responsible for pupillary light reflexes. In this specimen you can see the, uh, the inferior aspect of the, the cerebral hemispheres and the anterior aspect of the, the brain stem uh, uh, and this is the area of the thalamus here. Uh, you can see the, uh, the optic chiasma here, optic uh, nerves has been uh, removed here. This is the optic chiasma area and this is the, uh, the optic tract area, the two optic tracts and this is the lateral geniculate body where the optic tract, uh, some of the fibers in the optic tract uh, synapse before they uh, reach the uh, visual cortex. Third cranial nerve, oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve has two types of nuclei, the somatic motor nucleus and the visceral motor nucleus or the edinger westphal nucleus. It is, it is also called uh, accessory um, oculomotor nucleus and both these nuclei lie at the level of the superior colliculus of the midbrain. 
and uh, this uh, the, the, the optic nerve after originating from its nuclei uh, emerge from the ventral aspect of the uh, midbrain and um, you can find this nerve oculomotor nerve between the, the posterior cerebral artery this one and the superior cerebellar artery so this is a typical uh, appearance in a specimen um, to find the oculomotor nerve you can actually look for the the posterior cerebral and the uh, superior cerebellar arteries you get the nerve between the two and the trochlear nerve lies further laterally between the same two uh, arteries and then the optic nerve uh, enters the the cavernous sinus through its roof and is found in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus we will get back to it in a uh, in a slide later the oculomotor nerve supplies most of the extraocular muscles except the lateral rectus supplied by the abducens nerve sixth cranial nerve and the superior oblique muscle supplied by the the fourth cranial nerve or the trochlear nerve all the other extraocular muscles other than these two muscles are supplied by the uh, oculomotor nerve in this uh, diagram you can see a detailed uh, pathway of the oculomotor nerve uh, you can see the two nuclei here uh, the, the the somatic motor nucleus uh, appearing in red color and the, the parasympathetic or the visceral motor nucleus of the oculomotor nerve which are lying at the superior colliculus level of the uh, midbrain uh, the oculomotor nerve uh, later once it uh, comes out from the uh, cavernous sinus uh, divides into a superior division and an inferior division uh, and the parasympathetic fibers uh, pass with the inferior division parasympathetic fibers pass with the inferior division and the, the parasympathetic fibers uh, they have got uh, they form a ganglion uh, formed by the, the cell bodies of the postganglionic neuron here uh in the in the orbit and then the, the parasympathetic fibers will supply the ciliary muscles and the sphincter pupillary muscles and the sphincter pupillary muscles are responsible for constriction of the pupil constriction of the uh, pupil uh, then other muscles extraocular muscles as i said before are also supplied by these two divisions the medial rectus inferior rectus and inferior oblique muscles the superior division on the other hand it does not contain parasympathetic fibers this one does not contain parasympathetic fibers uh, and it, it supplies the, the the somatic motor component coming through the superior division will supply the superior rectus uh, muscle and uh, and then the levator palpebrae superioris muscle now this levator palpebrae superioris muscle is attached to the upper eyelid and it is important to uh, keep the eye open if this muscle is paralyzed there is uh, ptosis drooping of the uh, upper eyelid uh, then there is another point even though it is not directly related to the, the, the oculomotor nerve uh, uh, there is no sympathetic uh, outflow from the brain um, uh, you get the sympathetic to the head and the face region uh, from the, uh, the cervical um, sympathetic uh, chain uh, coming through the internal carotid plexus I'll, I'll get back to it later uh, so these sympathetic fibers uh, also enter the orbit to supply the structures there uh, so it, it, it supplies uh, the levator palpebrae superioris muscle and the dilator pupillary muscle now uh, we said the constrictor pupillary muscle is supplied by the, the, the parasympathetic fibers and constricts the pupil and the, the sympathetic fibers will supply the dilator pupillary muscle uh, and dilates the pupil and the other point is that we have already mentioned that the levator palpebrae superioris 
is uh, also supplied by the somatic motor component coming through the superior division of the oculomotor nerve and it is also supplied by the uh, sympathetic fibers coming through it. So it also has got two supplies, uh, sympathetic and uh, somatic motor uh, supply. Sympathetic nerves to the head and the face area is borrowed from the superior cervical ganglion in the neck and the sympathetic nerve fibers jump onto the internal carotid artery from the superior cervical ganglion and uh, passes through the internal carotid artery and then gets distributed into the structures in the, uh, the region of the head and the face. few more points about the levator palpebral superioris muscle. We have already said that the levator palpebral superioris muscle uh, is uh, supplied by both uh, sympathetic and uh, somatic motor nerves. Somatic motor nerves coming through the, the, op uh, the oculomotor nerve and the sympathetic nerves coming uh, through the internal carotid artery from the superior cervical uh, ganglia. Uh, if if the, the sympathetic nerves are damaged uh, because of the presence of uh, the intact somatic component coming through the oculomotor nerve, uh, there will be only partial ptosis, half ptosis. On the other hand, if the somatic component is damaged, which is coming through the, the oculomotor nerve, even though the sympathetic component is intact, uh, you get full ptosis. This is an example for full ptosis and partial uh, ptosis. In this lady, because of uh, damage to the oculomotor nerve, uh, there is uh, the full ptosis. And uh, here you get uh, partial ptosis due to damage to the sympathetic component. Now this partial ptosis is uh, found uh, in, uh, in Horner's syndrome where you get uh, damage to the superior cervical ganglion in the neck region. Okay, I will uh, try to explain a uh, few points related to uh, the oculomotor nerve uh, and the parasympathetic component of the oculomotor nerve and the sympathetic. Uh, so uh, it's like this. Uh, let's see if I take the color. Okay, now if uh, now first thing is I will talk about the uh, the. The levator palpebrae superior is part and the orbicular is oculi uh, part. Now, if you have the orbit like this, if you have the orbit like this, then if these are you know your eyelids, uh, eyelashes on them, uh, you have this uh, orbicular is oculi muscle surrounding the eyeball. This orbicular is oculi is supplied by seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. So the action of the facial nerve on the orbicularis oculi is to close, close the eye. Okay, similarly, uh, now you have this, uh, I should get a different color. You have this uh, levator palpebrae superioris muscle attached to the upper eyelid. When that contracts, you open the eye. You open the eye and there are two nerve supplies to this muscle. Uh, there are two nerve supplies to this muscle. Uh, first supply is uh, oculomotor nerve, the somatic supply. Second supply is sympathetic supply. Now, uh, when the when both supplies are there, then uh, the eye lid opens without a problem. If uh, a sympathetic is gone, if sympathetic is gone, then you will get uh, you will get uh, uh, partial ptosis. 
if oculomotor goes, uh, even though the sympathetic is there, you get full uh, ptosis. So that is the issue because oculomotor is uh, strong enough to um, open it. So that is uh, the point that you need to remember in relation to this, uh, this thing. Okay. Now the other point is, uh, if you add another thing to this uh, same diagram, now you have the cornea here, sorry, you have the cornea here, cornea of the eye, uh, in that area of the face, the whole area, you get the, uh, the, the sensory supply from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, of, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, uh, therefore the cornea of the eye also gets uh, um, uh, cornea and the sclera, okay, mainly the sclera rather than the cornea, cornea is in the center, it's the sclera of the eye, uh, you get uh, the, the conjunctiva, you know, covering that area, that gets the nerve supply from the ophthalmic, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, fifth nerve, trigeminal nerve. So if you touch that area, if you touch this area of the eye, then you get the sensory going through the ophthalmic division and you, uh, you create a reflex arc and the motor coming back through the uh, facial nerve and you immediately close the eye. Okay, so that is called corneal reflex. Okay, corneal reflex. So this, uh, these things look very complicated at the beginning, but they're very extremely interesting. These are all practical uh, issues. Okay, so just remember these things. That's why you know stopped uh, this. Then there's another point about this uh, pupillary uh, dilatation and constriction. Uh, if uh, take a different color. So if this is your pupil, if this is your pupil, you have uh, circular muscles surrounding the pupil like that, and you have radial muscles like this. Okay, now this uh, circular muscles. These circular muscles uh, are also called sphincter pupillae. Sphincter, sorry. Sphincter, sphincter pupillae muscle, um, sorry, constrictor pupillae muscle, and then these are dilator pupillae muscles. Sphincter pupillae or constrictor pupillae. Okay, these are called dilator. pupillary muscles, the radial ones, okay, uh, and the, the sphincter pupillary muscle is supplied by the, uh, the parasympathetic, parasympathetic dilator pupil is supplied by the sympathetic component which is coming from the neck. So when the parasympathetic is uh, gone for some, some reason, if you damage the parasympathetic component, then uh, the pupil gets dilated. Okay, it gets dilated because of the unopposed action on the sympathetic part. Okay, similarly, if you damage sympathetic, you get constriction of the pupil. Now, in Horner's syndrome, when the sympathetic is affected, you will get constriction of the pupil because the parasympathetic is uh, uh, unbalanced. Okay, uh, then when it comes to the, uh, the ciliary muscle, uh, this is the mechanism. Now, if you draw the lens, this is how you draw the lens. And uh, then lens is attached through what, what are called suspensory ligaments to the uh, ciliary muscle. This is how you draw it in a, uh, in a what do you call it, uh, a parasagittal section. Now when the muscle contracts, when the muscle contracts by parasympathetic here, parasympathetic, there is no sympathetic supply to the ciliary muscle, only parasympathetic supply. Uh, so depending on the sympathetic, uh, the parasympathetic tone, whether it's high or low, the constriction, uh, the contraction or relaxation of the ciliary muscle happens and based on that only, you get the, uh, the, the uh, increase, in, increase or decrease of the curvature of the lens. Now when the ciliary muscles contract, they move in that direction and that relaxes the, uh, the suspensory ligaments and the lens is such that uh, it's made of uh, elastic uh, tissues, surrounding tissues, and it always tries to increase its curvature, it's, which is prevented by the pull of the, uh, the, the suspensory ligament, which is attached to the lens at the periphery. Now, if I draw uh, an anterior view of the lens, this is the lens, and uh, this is the suspensory ligament all around the lens like this. Okay. 
so so this is what happens i'll draw it in that uh, view also so your ciliary muscle is like this it's circular muscle okay ciliary muscle is like this so you can understand that when the muscle contracts it reduces its aperture that's what happens to muscle uh, when something is arranged like this when it contracts so that relaxes the that relaxes the suspensory ligament and then uh, the moment it relaxes the curvature of the lens increases curvature of the lens increases so what happens is when the parasympathetic tone goes up uh, the curvature of the lens increases so that is the accommodation you know when you look from uh, you when you look at a near object you look at a distant object and then you suddenly look at a near object then uh, you have to uh, increase the curvature of the lens for focusing so that is done by parasympathetic um, supply okay uh, so understand this uh, the action of the ciliary muscle on the uh, lens of the eye so okay we will continue the video from there onwards when there is intracranial hemorrhage, especially extradural hemorrhage in relation to the middle meningeal vessels, uh, uncle herniation can take place and the oculomotor nerve is very closely related to the region of the, uh, the uncus and the, uh, the opening of the tentorium cerebelli. When the uncus herniates through the opening of the tentorium cerebelli, uh, the oculomotor nerve which is very closely related there can get compressed between the uncus, the herniating uncus and the edge of the tentorium cerebelli there. So this uh, grooving has taken place because of the uncle herniation and the compression of the uh, brain substance against the, um, the edge of the tentorium cerebella. So the, the oculomotor nerve that is there, you can see the oculomotor nerve on the other side here can get compressed between the, the free edge of the tentorium cerebella and the herniating uh, uncus. Uh, and then you can get uh, signs of oculomotor nerve palsy uh, which are you know extraocular muscle paralysis and dilatation of the pupil um, uh, and even you know, you know process of the eye if it is uh, severely paralyzed. Only one functional component is carried in the fourth cranial nerve or the trochlear nerve which is the somatic motor component uh, and we have already said that uh, the nucleus, the somatic motor nucleus of the trochlear nerve lies at the level of the inferior colliculus of the midbrain uh, and it, it emerges from the dorsal aspect of the brain. You can see it here, emerges from the dorsal aspect of the brain and it crosses uh, the, the midline and goes to the opposite side uh, on the inferior side like this. Uh, and then. Um, uh, it also travels in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus together with the oculomotor nerve and this is the nerve that supplies the, the superior uh, oblique muscle. Like the trochlear nerve, abducent nerve also carries one functional component which is somatic motor component and the somatic motor nucleus of the, the abducent nerve lies in relation to the facial colliculus underneath the facial uh, colliculus. Uh, it emerges between the pons and the pyramid of the medulla on the anterior aspect uh, and it also travels, it actually travels through the cavernous sinus, not on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, but uh, through the cavernous sinus um, together with the, the internal carotid artery and sympathetic plexus surrounding the internal carotid artery. And uh, it is the nerve that supplies the, the lateral rectus of the extraocular muscles. This is where the abducent nerve emerges from the brain stem. Uh, you can see it here emerging between the pons here and the, the, the pyramid of the medulla. This slide shows you a summary of the pathway of the third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves uh, which supply the extraocular muscles. 
uh, you can see first the ocular motor nerve uh, it um, it emerges from the ventral aspect of the midbrain uh, and uh, it enters as I said before enters the cavernous sinus through its roof and lies on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus uh, divides into superior and inferior divisions uh, and then enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. Trochlear nerve uh, emerges from the dorsal aspect of the, the midbrain uh, and it travels in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus together with the oculomotor nerve and enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. The abducens nerve emerges between the pons and the pyramid of the medulla as I showed you in the previous slide and uh, unlike the other two nerves the abducens nerve uh, travels within the cavernous sinus within the cavernous sinus and it also enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure you can see some of these structures uh, now this is uh, uh, oculomotor nerve number one oculomotor nerve and this is trochlear nerve you can read the legends here with the numbers uh, lying in the lateral wall of the the, the, the cavernous uh, sinus here and uh, this uh, number three here number three is the abducens nerve lying uh, within the cavernous sinus together with the internal carotid artery and the sympathetic nerves surrounding it then other than that you can see other two nerves here number four and number five the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve uh, lying below the uh, the third and fourth cranial nerves in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus fifth cranial nerve or the trigeminal nerve it has got two functional components the branchial motor component and the general somatic uh, sensory component um, the the nerve emerges from the uh, the ventral aspect of the uh, brain uh, and the, the general somatic uh, sensory component uh, and uh, the, the branchial motor component image emerge separately from the, uh, the, the the ventral aspect of the pons as uh, sensory root and the uh, motor root uh, this is the branchial motor component branchial motor component and this, uh, this these are the three parts of the, uh, the, the general somatic uh, sensory uh, component we will look at the trigeminal nerve in little bit more detail uh, you can see the, the the general somatic sensory nucleus here uh, I have shortened it uh, to make the diagram uh, easy to understand and uh, this is the, the branchial motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve now you already know the trigeminal nerve has uh, three divisions the ophthalmic division the maxillary division and the mandibular division um, now if you look at the arrangement of nerve, uh, the, the functional components here you can see uh, the, the somatic uh, the general somatic sensory component uh, is found in all three divisions of the trigeminal nerve the ophthalmic division maxillary division and the mandibular division but the branchial motor component is only found in the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve this is the reason uh, we we call mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve as the uh, first branchial arch nerve not the other two uh, and uh, and for the same reason the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve becomes a mixed nerve because it has both sensory and motor uh, components uh, then uh, the other point is you have already seen that the ophthalmic division and the maxillary division they lie in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus together with the optic uh, and uh, trochlear nerves uh, and uh, we have uh, talked about the, 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 the sensory nerves before and we have said the general rule of sensory nerves is to have the, the cell body of the first order neuron outside the central nervous system in a ganglia therefore uh, the, the, the first order neuron cell bodies of the, the, the sensory nerves 
coming through any of these divisions will lie in the uh, trigeminal ganglion in the middle cranial fossa. Uh, and uh, and, the, and the, the sensory, the general somatic sensory nucleus uh, lying in the, in the pons is actually the, uh, the cell bodies of the second order uh, neuron in the sensory uh, pathway. And the, the, the motor component, branchial motor component carried through the mandibular division will supply the muscles of uh, mastication. You can name the muscles of mastication, it's, it's a list of muscles, you have the temporalis muscle, you have the, the, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles, then the masseter muscle uh, and uh, then uh, other, other muscles like uh, anterior bellies of digastric and uh, the mylohyoid uh, muscles. Okay, so uh, that is uh, it, uh, the, the lecture. Now, uh, do you have any questions? If you have any questions, I can answer. Uh, third lecture we will do, uh, I think it's already scheduled. Anyone having questions? Since we have time, you can ask questions if you have. Yes, so now, uh, I think you have gone through the recording of the lecture uh, also, the previous lecture. So, if you have questions, please ask. We will do the remaining uh, part of the cranial lectures, uh, uh, the third lecture next time. And if we have time, we will go through the brainstem sections. Otherwise, I might be able to upload that part of the lecture to YouTube or somewhere and uh, get you to watch that one if I have the recording. Yes, no questions. Strange now that you don't have any questions. Hmm.